Audio Jungle. Hello guys, uh, so weekend is here and so am I uh, with some amazing speakers. I am Dr. Pallavi Mahajan, an endodontist, a writer, spoken word performer and your host for scientific sessions in DRDCA 2020. So we started on 1st of November and we finished on 28th of November. It has been an amazing learning experience with 40 plus speakers joining us from all over the world and there's few of them still left, right? Uh, all the sessions are available on YouTube, Facebook, and app. So for those who are joining us for the uh, first time, Dental Reach uh, Digital Conference and Awards 2020 International is a virtual conference. And it's going on, as I said, it's been going on um, since 1st of November. What you need to do uh, to participate you know, actively is to register for that. Uh, you need to download event app. Search for DRDCA, click on it, and that's it. You we, you will be registered. What you get is 40 CD points and certificate of participation. You directly get contact details of many speakers, which is there on app. And also, uh, all the sessions are there on app. So happy connecting, guys. And I hope if you're joining for the first time, you stay with us till 28th of November. Now, as I said, uh, just last few days, few lectures, few speakers are left, and it's been an incredible learning um, experience for me. Thanks for all of you who are joining. You know, it, I know it's a weekend, it's a morning, lazy winter morning, especially in uh, India. So those who are listening, thank you so much. Uh, we had last two, last session was uh, amazing. We had Dr. Prem and Dr. Surbhi joined, uh, joining us. And the, their session, it's available on YouTube. Facebook DRDC page as well as app. Today, also, we have amazing speakers with us. Um, now, it's been said that necessity is the mother of invention, right? But then, even though necessities are there, not everybody turns an inventor. The first speaker that we have today turned out to be one. I'm talking about Dr. Jiro Abe, SCN CD and BPS specialist, who is joining us from Japan and is going to speak about his invention and concept of SEMCD, 
suction effective mandibular complete denture. He made this invention in 1999 after you know experiencing his share of unstable mandibular dentures. Dr. Jiro Abe graduated from Tokyo Dental College. He developed the suction mechanism of mandibular complete dentures, as I said, in 1999, and has been diffusing it throughout the world since 2004. He was the director of the Academy of Clinical Dentistry from 1999 to 2005, and its counselor from 2005 to 9. He founded Japan Denture, Denture Association and has been its chairman from 2006 to 2015. He has stayed active as a former president of Japan Plate Denture Association since 2015. He is the instructor of Ivoclar, VivaDent, VPS International, Clinical, and GCN Morita. He has been in various activities as a professor at Tokyo University Graduate School of Dentistry and Kangwa Dental College since 2012. Dr. Abe is an author of two best selling books, out of which one, uh, Mandibular Suction Effective Denture, Professional, Clinical, and Lab Technique was translated into English, Chinese, and Korean due to popular demand. He has been active as an international committee member of the American Posturontic Society since 2015. You are going to see Dr. Uh, Abe twice, today and tomorrow, and learn all about his concept of suction-effective mandibular complete denture. So without wasting any more time, uh, please join your hands virtually and uh, welcome Dr. Abe on your screens now. Dear colleagues, I'm Dr. Abe from Japan. So today I'm very, very honored to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank the Organization of Dental Research Digital Conference and uh, for inviting me this beautiful uh, webinar. And also I'd like to thank uh, for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak to you today entitled Suction effective mandibular complete dentures combined with biofunctional prosthetic system. So, uh, my presentation will be separated into the suction mechanism of the mandibular complete denture. I will talk about this today. And the day second, um, the, I, I would like to highlight the intraoral examination of key features of the custom tray design needed to achieve mandibular suction. After that, uh, my pupil, Dr. Yamasaki, uh, will be report easy and difficult cases of SCMCD dentures. So I hope you will enjoy and you, you will find my presentation and Dr. Yamasaki's presentation to be informative. So from now on, I'd like to highlight the suction mechanism of the mandibular complete denture. Prosthetic management for a dentalist patient has long been a major challenge for dentistry. This is my first question to you. What other complaints patients have? My answer is crystal clear. Touch, touch, touch. The worst dentist situation is the maxillary denture that drops down immediately. Oh, oh my gosh. Dental hygienist is laughing. So, and this danger was fabricated by a young dentist. The second worst danger situation is mandibular danger that lifts up easily when the patients open their mouth. So we frequently see the same problem around the world. And this video shows you how difficult it is to learn the skill to achieve mandibular suction. To overcome this problem, I developed suction concept mechanism and the technology in 1999. Unfortunately, a Japanese publishing company were not associated with English book sale. So first English English book was published in 2012. Anyway, what is suction?
This is suction. As you can see, the suction denture is superior than the conventional denture in regard to the retention. Why are the conventional dentures unable to achieve mandibular suction? These impressions are taken from the same patient. And on your left, uh, they are impressions according to the conventional denture we are all taught in the dental school. The conventional type of impression is oriented to take muscle attachment in order to design a denture. And the aim of the conventional denture is to achieve better masticatory performance through enlargement of the denture bearing zone. On your right, these are impressions from the suction concept. The purpose of the suction denture is to seal the entire denture border with all other mucous membrane, but not muscle. Thus, a different concept result in two different constructions. The denture on your left was fabricated according to the conventional denture concept. The denture on your right was fabricated according to the suction concept. I think you must have thought that the suction denture would be larger than the conventional denture. But the fact is contrary. Suction denture is smaller than that of conventional denture. I'm not the first person to show the suction video to the audience members. Dr. Giulio Pretti from Italy and Dr. Somer, who was my mentor because he passed away, so showed the suction, vid suction video using compound impression materials. So please take a look at the video. This is a stick compound technique. Their impression technique was splendid. However, it was too difficult, too technical sensitive for everyone to perform that. Many people must have thought that uh, it was impossible to achieve mandibular suction at that time. To overcome this problem, I developed suction mechanism concept and the technology in 1999 I have already mentioned. And it must be theoretical and practical. And it must be useful for dental education. So, by the way, what is the best easy to learn systematic denture fabrication system achieving mandibular suction? I found the biofunctional prosthetic system from Ibocla Vivadent. Why do I recommend BPS? Why did I select BPS from among many ways? I'd like to derive an answer from this study. Dr. Fellon uh, concluded that the most important aspect to satisfy patient with our denture was to obtain accurate reproduction of jaw-to-jaw -jaw relationship. Yeah. And the second requirement is lower denture stability that is suitable for suction concept. By the way, what's the best denture fabrication system to agree with first requirement to obtain your relationship? I firmly believe that biofunctional prosthetic system is the best way to achieve mandibular suction because BPS has unique three-step procedures of determining vertical dimension and the horizontal mandibular jaw position through that process. In the first say, phase, centric tray bite is taken. Casts are mounted using the centric tray bite. And the custom trays are designed. And the impressions are taken. Just after finishing the precision impressions, uh, we needed to move on to uh, check if the vertical dimension is correct or not. This is a phonetic method. And he is counting backwards from 50 to uh, 40. I'm sorry, in Japanese. We needed to focus on the speaking space approximately three millimeters between upper and lower plates. And this method 
allows the patient to concentrate on just counting. And also, patient easily forgets to be observed by the operator. I think it's a nice method uh, to check the vertical dimension. And upper and lower white plates are replaced with a nathometer M. Then back to the mouth and ask the patient move her jaw forward, backward, forward, backward, side to side uh, to describe the gothic arch. It's a nice method to determine the intercuspal position for to set up. In truth, success rate of section effective mandibular complementation is not 100%. 87% success. So, uh, remaining 13% of dangerous patients cannot get enough suction. Some of them need the therapeutic denture to normalize their mandibular jaw position before final denture fabrication. And some of them need implants to enhance their oral function. And I hesitantly recommend a commercially available denture adhesive to the patients with dementia or dry mouth. In 2000, most dentists assumed that uh, complete dental treatment would be uh, replaced entirely by the implant restorations. However, the technique I was advocating continued to enjoy seminar participants because of its ability to achieve mandibular denture suction that was impossible for conventional denture technique. And the suction denture uh, contributes to uh, not only dental education. Yeah, very nice. She was a young dentist, but she uh, to completed uh, lower suction denture according to my suction concept. And uh, um, I stay active part of expanding suction effective mandibular denture around the world in cooperation with Ivo Viva Dent Company. They are instructors of SMCD in the world. Three Indian dentists came to my office to learn my denture technique. Uh, Dr. Balbil and uh, Dr. Um, Amandeep and Dr. Nitin. So uh, they learned uh, and they, they joined uh, my so hands-on course with a live patient uh, in my office. Oh, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I hope they will expand my denture technique in India present. What is absolutely required for complete denture suction? My answer is crystal clear. Regardless of whether it's a maxilla or mandibular, there is no instance where air breaks the seal. If the seal is not perfect in even one place, the maxillary denture will drop down and the mandibular denture will lift up. It's a big problem for the patients. I'd like to explain it more clearly, how to create negative pressure and adhesion in the interior side of the denture. Let's look at the suction cap. Negative pressure is activated. If the one leaves cap peripheral, negative pressure is released. Regarding complete dentures, when the patient occludes, saliva under the denture base is discharged. Finally, negative pressure and adhesion with saliva are created in the interior side of the dentures. Why is it difficult to create the suction denture in the mandible? So I think there are three reasons. First one is that uh, uh, mandibular sealing area is very, very smaller than that of maxilla. Second reason is that uh, a tongue is located in the mandible. So when the tongue moves up and forward, the air leaking spot would be easily created around the sublingual region. The third reason is that um, 
move of volume of the mandibular mucobacular fold is two or three times greater than that of maxilla. I'd like to show you precise animated movie. Uh, this animation is the production of uh, X-ray TV images from Tokyo Dental College in 1975. Take a look at the yellow arrow. Lower mucobacal fold is moving a lot rather than the maxillary one. So this is the reason mandibular denture impression is, is more difficult than the maxillary one. When knitting, the lower jaw, tongue, and cheek are delicately interacting in coordinated movement. This is my study on MRI. Little part is a vaccinator muscle and yellow part is uh, submucosal tissue that is thicker than the uh, vaccinator muscle. So you, you have already found that uh, the denture border com completely comes in contact with all of the mucous membrane but not muscle. I, I would like to emphasize that the main prayer of the denture seal is the oral mucous membrane, but not muscle. But the main factor of oral function is the muscle. Please separate them. Okay, let's move on to the suction mechanism. I'd like to talk about the suction mechanism of the maxillary denture. And that is comprised of two different types of closure. I'd like to talk about the suction mechanism of the uh, around the uh, uh, labial and the buccal region, indicated by the blue arrows. So, exterior denture border comes in contact with lip tissue and buccal mucosa, and the interior side of the denture border comes in contact with uh, the ridge mucosa. So, it's a very, very strong closure. It's called interior exterior double closure, like a sandwich. The most difficult sealing area of the maxilla is the palatal posterior end seal. It's close contact closure. When air enters in this area beyond the sealing of the saliva tensile force, maxillary denture will drop. So, to overcome this problem, uh, the functional postdam is highly recommended after, just after precision impression. Functional postdam is not useful in all cases, especially uh, in a case with maxillary flabby tissue like this. Even after uh, final denture impression, when biting the denture is up shifting and forward like this, then posterior and the seal would break. To solve this problem, the monophase impression material is applied at the posterior end of the denture border to make the functional postdom. Place it back to the mouth and ask the patient close together. Of course, excess impression material should be wiped off to prevent the gag reflex. And be sure not to ask the patient to keep the biting. No, I keep it still. Keep it gently. Okay? In conclusion, the suction mechanism of the maxillary denture is comprised of two different types of closures. The interior-exterior double closure and the close contact closure. So let's move on to the suction mechanism of the mandibular complete denture. It's more complicated than the maxillary one because it's uh, comprised of four different types of closures. So let's move on to the explanation of uh, the suction mechanism around the labial and buccal region first. It's identical to the uh, maxillary labial and the buccal region. Exterior surface of the denture border comes in contact with lip support and the uh, buccal mucosa, and uh, the interior side of the denture border comes in contact with the lip mucosa. So it, it's a, 
uh, interior exterior double closure. Very, very strong closure. When fabricating custom trays, the thickness should be given to the uh, back or shelf region so to enhance the denture bearing zone. And uh, we sometimes encounter patients with shallow labial vestibule. The more thickness should be given to the labial part. So take a look at the photographs of actor and actress from Korea. They have a beautiful dent here at the mental spurt. So I firmly believe that more thickness make it possible uh, to create such a nice beautiful condition similar to this. I'd like to move on to the ceiling of the lingual area that is separated into the ceiling around the sublingual region and ceiling around the literal monohyoid fossa region. So prior to the detailed explanation of the lingual ceiling, I'd like to show you two difficult uh, ceiling areas first. In the tongue tracks, you can see the air leaking space, the area around the sublingual region, and the area of the little molar pad region. Please take a look at the line number one at the sublingual region. This is a cross section shown as line number one. Please take a look at the middle slide. And uh, as you can see, there is no space under the dingle denture base and the, uh, the thick denture base, dingle denture border can be seen. So at the first sight, you notice that the uh, lower residual ridge is inclined to the right, but please focus on the sublinear spongy tissue that is located behind the anterior ridge. This is a closed section. Please focus on the blue line. At the mouth opening, the seal do not be compromised, so it's a very, very strong closure. The vacuum of the denture will be maintained thanks to the sufficient sublingual spongy tissue. And it's no exaggeration to say that the degree of suction and depends largely on the amount of sublingual spongy tissue. So as you can see, uh, it shows us the perfect closure at the sublingual region because uh, lingual denture border completely engaged with the uh, sublingual spongy tissue. There is no space. In order to reinforce the interior exterior double closure with the sublingual spongy tissue, the thickness should be provided to the a lingual denture border, custom tray bo denture border, and also final denture as well. So that uh, uh, the strong enough suction will be maintained. Here, I'd like to show you the precision impression technique to achieve mandibular suction in straightforward case. So the operator always asks the patient to make five exercises when taking impression. And be sure this impression technique is closed mouth impression, but not open the mouth impression technique. So first ask the patient. So tighten lips, say E, U, E to capture the labial and the uh, lip movements. And then next, move the tongue across the upper lip to capture the tongue movement. And next, uh, push the back side of the anterior bite limbs with the tongue because the uh, lingual floor becomes uh, stiff by this movement. And finally, so ask the patient to swallow. Uh, it's a comprehensive movement combining uh, above movements. So upper precision impression has been done and the impression body is placed back to the mouth. And the lower tray applied with the light bodied impression materials after border molding. 
and ask the patient to close together and confirm the uh, correct position of the mandible. U, E, two movements. Hold the tray firmly down and ask the patient to move her tongue side to side and stick out. And lock the chin and ask the patient to push the back side of the, of, of the bite ribs. And swallow. Please ask the patient two or three times until the impression material is set. So uh, this is a, a result of the impression. Very beautiful, no air bubbles. And as you can see, the sickness can be, sickness is provided to the sublingual lesion and the very thinness um, of the dental border is provided to the little model how the fossa lesion. And uh, to enhance the occlusal force, the thickness should be given to the back or shelf region. So it's a perfect impression. However, uh, we sometimes encounter a difficult patient without sublingual spondy tissue. As you can see, no sublingual spondy tissue behind the anterior ridge. So the ceiling area would be extremely small here. So for a denture easily removed away, caused by the lack of sublingual spondy tissue. Today, due to the time limitation, I cannot uh, show you the optional impression technique to solve this problem, but uh, in the near future, I will tell you. Can you notice another problem? The tongue retraction. Patient involuntarily and that, uh, retracts her tongue, so over maybe so five centimeter from the anterior ridge. In 75% of indentures patients, tongue retracts slightly within two centimeters. In type one, type two, the patient retracts the tongue further and even further. So it's very difficult for us to achieve mandibular denture suction. These are the comparison between the uh, effective suction effectiveness and the suction ineffectiveness. So as you can see, on your, on your left, there is no space. Denture border completely engaged with the sublingual spongy tissue. And on the contrary, you can see the air leaking area behind the uh, den lingual denture border. It's a uh, suction ineffective. Let's move on to the highlight, uh, the explanation of uh, uh, suction mechanism along the little model how the fossil region. And please take a look at the middle slide here. And uh, it's a cross section shown as line number two at the little model how the fossil lesion. And uh, you have already noticed that uh, there is a space under the denture base. So it's not the perfect closure. It's called the compensatory closure that is attained with the tongue sidewall by applying pressure toward the denture underneath. So the resisted wall against the tongue pressure should be essential regardless of whether uh, the ridge form is favorable, unfavorable, or poor. And um, it will be created uh, with uh, this is millimeter extension over the malohyoid line. The left figure shows us the uh, sufficient extension of the denture border to complete the compensatory closure with a, a proper overextension. On your right, the denture border doesn't reach the malohyoid line where it is indicated by blue circle here. Yeah. So uh, the denture, uh, it allows the denture easily sift away by the tongue pressure. So it's suction ineffective. To complete the compensatory closure at the little model had a fossil lesion, the thinness should be 
provided to the uh, lingual dentia border. And not only uh, custom tray and final dentia as well. By the way, there are two criticisms um, from uh, anatomical field and uh, a physiologic field in regard to the overextension. Dr. Nangel reported that the extension over the malohyoid line interrupts the muscle activity. This report is published in 1958. It's a very, very old report. So, from the current of anatomical point of view, denture border can be extended over the malohyoid line inferiorly, even at the maximum contraction of the malohyoid muscle. So, and uh, another opinion is from uh, physiologic field. Uh, this space is created from the dangerous time, but not uh, created after a dangerous time. So, uh, denture, denture base shouldn't be extended over the model how the line. Yeah, this opinion is almost correct. So here, let me pose you a question. Do you cover the maxillary palate region with a denture base when fabricating upper denture? Everyone says yes, of course, because it prevents the maxillary denture from being dislodged. So let me pose your question again. Why do, does Dr. Abe extend the denture border over the Manohaud line? My answer is crystal clear. To complete the compensatory closure. Because the series is not perfect even at one place, the mandibular denture will lift. So, um, frankly speaking, it's, it's called the necessary evil to complete the compensatory closure. In order to take static impression around the retinal region, I developed the flame cutback tray. And these are characteristics of flame cutback tray. Uh, tray. This tray has a major effect to reduce or minimize the deformation of the retinal region, and we can take static impression in its closed mouth. Now, I'd like to show you how to take preliminary impression using frame cutback tray. So, light bodied impression material is squirted from lingual lithium pad region and uh, opposite side. And I go back to the so starting point and uh, be sure uh, light bodied impression material uh, should be squirted continuously. And the next frame cutback tray applied with, molded with uh, heavy body impression material is inserted into the mouth, apply pressure slightly and uh, ask the patient to uh, stick out the tongue. And uh, please wait for seven seconds and uh, change your finger position, apply pressure slightly. Be sure not to rotate the tray down posteriorly because the little more part would be isolated. And ask the patient to close her mouth. And finally, massage. This maneuver prevents accumulation of the excess impression materials within the cheeks. So this case is uh, poor legi form, so, but a very beautiful little part shape can be seen. I believe that the purpose of the frame cutback tray is to reduce the deformation of the retinal pad region uh, when taking preliminary impression. And I thought, uh, it's thought that, that this impression technique using frame cutback tray is the first step to complete the mandibular suction denture custom tray. So it's very, very so useful to take a suction impression uh, according to the closed mouth impression technique. Why should the little pads be taken with a closed mouth? You have already learned that little pads are easily deformable. And there are two different shapes between open mouth condition and closed mouth condition. 
if you fabricate a mandibular denture uh, according to the com uh, closed mouth impression technique, denture inserted into the mouth, yeah, and the mouth is op uh, when the mouth mouth is opening, but full coverage of the denture base control the deformation of the retinal pad, and also uh, when biting, negative pressure easily uh, created interior side of the denture. On the contrary, if you fabricate a lower denture uh, according to the open mouth impression technique, like a compound, you know, do you remember? Denture is inserted into the mouth and the clo uh, when the clo mouth closes, the air leaking spot is created around the retinal pad region. Uh, this is the reason and the closed mouth impression using a frame cutback tray is highly recommended if we want to achieve mandibular suction. These are the comparison of two preliminary impression techniques. These are taken from the same patient. And the left impression was taken according to the conventional concept with pressure-loaded method using the stock tray. All of the submucosal tissue was completely stretched out so that uh, uh, students and the educators can easily find the muscle attachments on the impression or so on the uh, in preliminary plaster model. On your right, so uh, they are impressions for, according to the suction concept using frame cutback tray. And the surface of the impression is wrinkled because uh, it's a static impression without any pressure. So, uh, and the original impression materials were uh, mixed with more water contrary to the uh, normal liquid powder ratio. So, the purpose of the suction denture is to take static impression along the retinal pad region. Be sure not to expand the lateral molar pad region. So uh, take a look at the lateral molar pad on your left impression. So uh, lateral molar pads are completely stretched out. It's not a natural shape of the lateral molar pad region. So this is the reason. And the frame cutback tray is highly recommended for everyone if you want to achieve mandibular suction uh, in the first step to fabricate lower suction effective complete denture. Let's move on to the final part to explain about the exterior closure of the denture base by close contact with the tongue side wall and the buccal mucosa uh, on the retinal pad. It's called the BTC point, buccal mucosa, tongue side wall, and the contact point. How is, that go how is the denture going to be sealed? Denture is inserted into the mouth, and the mouth is closing slowly, slowly, and the mouth has just closed. Then BTC point appears on the retinal pad region. So regardless of whether it's a healthy dentist people or a dangerous people, BTC point appears when the mouth closes. So, I firmly believe that the BTC point is an essential physiologic feature for, every, for everyone. Um, the uh, duplicated denture is fabricated to, in, to observe the variation of the retinal pad region with endoscopic camera. There is a tongue and a back of mucosa and the mouth is opening, the TC point disappears, and the mouth is closing slowly, then the TC point is cr created. The same finding uh, can be observed on MRI. It's now clear that uh, the seal on the dimmer pad is created mainly with uh, close contact closure. BTC point is a secondary mechanism. The BTC point ensures the building up of the negative pressure interior side of the denture when swallowing. 
And uh, uh, this is an additional experiment uh, to extend the denture border with locks. Overextension of the denture border with locks interrupt the uh, buccal mucosa covering on the retinal pad region. BTC point disappears on the MRI, so space is created. So be careful. So the overextension of the denture border uh, sometimes breaks the seal. Next additional experiment is denture border inferiorly with wax. So that uh, a BTC point disappears on that case. So be sure not to overextend the denture border inferiorly uh, to the little mile how the post region. The tongue didn't lift up to form the BTC point. So um, I'd like to reconfirm what the meaning of the formation of BTC points is. If the BTC points are not formed, please check if the back or shave denture border is overexpanded or not, the lingual denture border is overextended or not, and finally, please check if the tooth position is correct or not. It's very important for us uh, to achieve mandibular suction. Posterior teeth are arranged in the middle of the crest in general to achieve mandibular suction. The pound line is also used for index for to set up. It's very important for us uh, to achieve mandibular suction. In order to acquire the beautiful and adequate BTC point, the retinal pads should be covered thinly and full coverage is very important uh, to uh, achieve mandibular suction, so to complete the close contact closure. And uh, concavity is created in the tongue root area, and the back of shelf should be modeled in concavity here to form the BTC point easily. And finally, avoid the sinew string. What is the sinew string? Dr. Somaya, who is my mentor, uh, discovered the uh, sinew string. So, as you can see, the uh, sinus ring is located at the buccal base of the pad. The appearance weight of the sinus ring is uh, approximately 13% in average. However, when the operator pulls the buccal mucosa outward like this, so the uh, appearance rate is going up to 40%. The sinew string is considered to be able to see in a case with uh, tendons between the vaccinator muscle and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. And it's thought that uh, the, the load of sinew string is to pull the buccal mucosa inward, um, contributing the formation of BTC points. Do we manage this string clinically? The denture base forming on the retinal pad region differs greatly from patient to patient depending on the individual condition of sinew string. There are three different types of sinew string I will show you. In order not to interrupt the buccal mucosa to cover the retinal pad region completely, slight curvy slightly deeper, much deeper notch of the weak, moderate, strong sinew string should be created respectively. Where are BTC points located? In general, BTC point is located one third from the posterior end of the retinal pad region. So the BTC point is uh, is on the uh, denture base, so it's suction effective. On your right, denture border doesn't reach the BTC point, so air space is created. 
at the posterior end of the behind the rhythm and behind the danger base. So it's suction ineffective. Measuring experiment to pull the suction denture base by the digital force gauge was conducted to study how much of the retinal pad region should be covered with a denture base to obtain sufficient suction action. Suction denture base is created and the operator pull it up to measure the negative pressure. It's And the denture border is trimmed off from posterior to anterior of the retinal pad region like this. Okay. This is the outcome of this study. Two thirds of retinal pad is to be covered if you want to achieve mandibular suction. I'd like to verify the suction effectiveness through the observation of the X-ray TV images. This patient wore good suction lower denture. And now I'm showing you the X-ray TV images. This is the actual record. So you know, um, shooting X-ray is prohibited when the mastication is observed. But it's permitted presently when only fan the garret of swallowing is observed. The purpose of this recording video is to observe the swallowing. Please be sure. This is a frontal view. So you may notice that Lower denture movement is tightly coordinated with lower jaw movement. And first, the unilateral balance occlusion is established and gradually move on to the bilateral balance occlusion. And she is eating dumpling with volume and swallow. Next, I'd like to show you the lateral view. Her mastication speed and the uh, rhythm are very nice. That is similar to healthy dented people. But uh, she has a one problem, aging problem, because she couldn't swallow food at once. She swallowed it with second. It's an aging problem. So I, I want to say that uh, suction effective mandibular complete denture increase the patient's mastication. And the next, I'd like to show you another video. So unfortunately, this patient wore ill fit dentures. He wore a good suction upper denture. but lower denture flips up. This is X-ray TV images frontal view. Now you may notice that uh, his mastication is only one-sided. And the chewing speed is very slow and irregular. So please pay attention. So food is dropping to the slot being voluntarily. It's a very dangerous situation to have a risk of choking and uh, aspiration. And next, uh, this is a lateral view. And he is eating dumpling on his front teeth. It's very difficult for healthy dented people to do that. I cannot. So it's a um, unusual. So I conclude that ill fit denture, non suction denture causes him to make big problems of mastication. I'd like to give you an information of uh, my book sale and uh, products and uh, materials sales. 
So on your left, uh, my first English book was published in 2012. And uh, however, after publishing a second book, so uh, the Quittis company decided to uh, discontinue copying my first book. So you cannot purchase it at present. However, I have many good reputations from leaders to renew and the mandibular suction effective complete danger in the BPS. Uh, so I, so I have started writing new ebook and that will be published next January in 2021 from Amazon Prime. That would be very great if you could purchase it. Entitled, Everyone Can Achieve Mandibular Denture Suction. And regarding a frame cutback tray, so you can easily replace or order it uh, to ID Denmet private company in India. Other BPS products, materials, and devices, you can easily purchase them by Ivo Club Vivident India. Thank you for understanding of these points. I will go the rewards of suction effective mandibular complete danger. I think, of course, patients are very happy to minimize the danger mobility during function and the phonation. And they will have a social situation thanks to suction effective mandibular complete dentures. And we feel we are doing a better job of helping patients with our suction dentures. And the suction denture is less expense than the implant of dentures. And finally, with more satisfied patient you treat, you will get more referrals. So, um, I emphasize that everyone can achieve mandibular denture suction. Thank you for attention. Hello everyone. So that was Dr. Ave guys. And uh, let's see if he, I don't know where. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Yama. How are you? Yeah. I'm fine. And uh, I enjoy the Dr. Ave's lecture now. Right, right, right. Dr. Ave is not joining us, right? Yes. So I am actually for those who are joining and seeing you time dr yamazaki is going to he's a bps scm cd and bps specialist again and he's going yeah. to join us tomorrow right tomorrow oh, morning yeah. session for case yeah. series uh, of yeah. scm cd denture dr yeah. um, abe has already given you brief overview of the whole procedure and uh, dr yamazaki will be there with us tomorrow morning to answer <laughs> um, different you know the further explaining the whole procedure i welcome you dr yamazaki on the platform of drdca thank yeah. you so much for being here um can i can i start asking you questions sir oh yeah sure okay uh, so the first question is uh, does providing so much suction cause mm. resorption of ridge mm, of fridge what does it mean? resorption of ridge uh, Elimination no. of ridge. Uh, advanced bone resorption. Right, 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 right. Yes, uh, it is possible to fabricate uh, suction danger in such cases. Uh, no. Like to... mm -hmm. no. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, further, I... further. Does it resorb it further? Hmm. Yeah, it is possible. Okay. Hmm. Uh, already, if, if there is a resorbed ridge, we can give a uh, denture, right? Hmm. It's possible. But what about uh, future, future of the denture? Uh, ah, yes. Uh, I, we believe that the speed of the bone resorption 
could be reduced using the same CD because oh, okay. uh, well-fitting well denture uh, is a better for patients' jaw condition. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, another yeah. question. Hmm. What if we place implants and not hmm. give suction? What if we place implants on the in the bone for retention and give an over-denture or something? Uh, what? How hmm. is it different from giving suction in the denture? Uh, yeah. Uh, suction denture is a very good uh, uh, shape for implant over denture also. Uh, conventional okay. denture is too big for uh, two implant over dentures. So we believe that you know, we have uh, many cases uh, fabricated the same CD for two implant over, over dentures patients. So uh, you can try the same CD technique not only a dental patient, but also to implant over patient. Okay. 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 Another question, mm -hmm. what about the cleanliness? How to maintain clean the denture, this one, suction denture? Is there anything that we need to do? Uh, cleaning. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, we ask, uh, educate the patient, cleaning the with the special uh, cleaning material for dentures. Okay, there's a special material. Uh, just a uh, commercial material. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question for the session, sir. What about adaptation of patients who shift from normal denture? A patient who is uh, old and is wearing denture for a long time, a normal denture. If we tell him to shift to suctional denture, is it the transition is smooth, it's easy, it's comfortable for patients? How is it in your experience? Yes, it is a very good question. Uh, it is necessary to educate the patient. Uh, we need a training period for new denture. Even if the suction denture or another technique, patients okay. need a training period. Uh, many literature reported uh, we need a one month to okay. Yeah, adapt uh, new dentures. Okay. It is a safe way to okay. educate. So uh, we have to educate them by calling them to our practice and every time we have to uh, insert and teach them how to do it basically. Yes, it's okay. true. And tomorrow my presentation, I would like to talk about it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and yeah. I think everybody is looking forward to your presentation now. Because we already know the concept, but it will be wonderful mm. to have you with us and present those cases. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Yamazaki, for coming and yeah, answering these questions. Yeah. And I'll I see you tomorrow. you tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. So that was Dr. Yamazaki. Dr. Uh, Jiro Abe had to leave. There was some network problem. So I'm very glad that Dr. Yamazaki joined and answer your questions, guys. So, um, there might be some other questions, especially after you hear this uh, session once again. There will be a lot of questions. So come back tomorrow morning. There's another session with Dr. Jiro Abe and Dr. Yamazaki. And they are going to explain this technique further. Every new thing takes time to, you know, to uh, we need time to absorb all those things. So yes, uh, we'll, uh, they'll see you tomorrow once again. Uh, <clears throat> for the second part of two-day SEM CD, uh, with BTS webinar program. So that is what it is. Uh, okay, guys. So the next session, the next session that we have today is some a session I'm very keen to know about and learn about. Now imagine a patient walking into your clinic, grossly mutilated teeth in a bad condition. You know that root canal can be done for that patient, but you're not sure how to prosthodontically rehabilitate it, how, how to give crown to that patient, how to make that tooth function. Because if you're not able to provide crown, if you're not able to provide coronal, um, you know, a, a coronal structure to that tooth, there's no point of having just that tooth. It's, it will not be in function. So how to do that? I'm not going to explain any of that. Hey, Jacob. A uh, prosthodontist joining us from India to explain about management of grossly mutilated teeth. Education and maxillofacial processes from UCLA. He's a professor, Department of Prosthodontics, Vedahi Institute of Dental Sciences, Bangalore. 
He is chief executive at Ora Care Dental Clinic, Bangalore. He is key opinion leader for 3M SP, country representative to the European Prosthodontic Association. I am sure he has a lot of things to share. His experience, his tips and tricks as far as prosthodontic rehabilitation of mutilated teeth is concerned. So please welcome Dr. P.C. Jacob on your screens right now. Uh, thank you, um, uh, you know, uh, to uh, DRDC and uh, thank you to Roxan and um, uh, Nupur and Pallavi for inviting me to give this lecture. It's always a pleasure to, you know, to speak uh, over the last uh, eight or nine months. We have gotten used to speaking to our computer screens. And so I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, this is a very favorite topic of mine. And I look forward to, um, you know, interacting with all of you. So let's uh, uh, start with the presentation. So do I uh, do I just go into my presentation or? Just share the screen, sir. Oh, just share the screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Your screen is already. OK, you need to share your screen, sir. Okay. Do I need to go into my presentation? Yes, okay. so you have to open your PowerPoint. Okay. Is that okay? Is that we, can, we can see that, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Okay. So all of us uh, who have uh, practiced dentistry have come across grossly mutilated teeth. Of course, these are not grossly mutilated, but um, you know, this is a, a young lady who had trauma and we need to be able to take her from a situation like this to a situation like this where she gets back her normal uh, dentition. And especially if the teeth are uh, in the front, then it becomes even more imperative that um, you know, we get back uh, her aesthetics and her function. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, we, we have only 50 minutes and so I may have to go through uh, some things quickly. Um, and, um, you know, these are the topics that we are going to be talking about. We are going to be talking about whether post should be used for all endodontically treated teeth. You know, the concepts have changed over the years. Um, whether these should be custom made or whether they should be prefabricated, uh, what type of core material should be used and um, where, then is coronal coverage required? That's a very important question. Do all uh, you know, root canal treated teeth require coronal coverage? And if they do require, then what type of coronal coverage? Um, of course, a lot of us are shifting more and more towards all ceramic restorations and therefore what are the types of all ceramic restorations and where should they be used and how should we achieve predictable restoration. So these are some of the topics that we are going to go through very, very quickly. So the first question is, are endodontically treated teeth different, you know, and so if you think about it, the classic studies like um, by uh, Helfer in 1972 said that endodontically treated teeth are different. And why are they different? They said that the dentin in these teeth were more brittle due to loss of water because you have removed uh, the pulp from inside. And secondly, because of loss of collagen cross-linking. Now collagen cross-linking we all know is, is a very important uh, feature. And they thought that because of uh, removal of uh, the pulp that the, there was loss of collagen cross-linking. However, in 1992, Sedley said that, you know, he took um, 23 endodontically treated teeth and their counter uh, counterparts and tested them, um, uh, you know, tested their uh, bio uh, biomechanical strength. And he found, and this is what he said, he said that the similarity between the biomechanical properties of endodontically treated teeth and their contralateral vital pairs indicates that teeth do not become more brittle following endodontic treatment. He said, what did he say? He said, they do not become more brittle following endodontic treatment. And he also said that other factors may be more critical to failure of endodontically treated teeth. 
Now, what are these other factors that he meant? If you take a study in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry by Asif in 1994, he said that these were the causes for endodontically treated teeth becoming brittle. That is the loss of structural integrity due to uh, access, pulp, uh, access preparation and the missing tooth structure and not changes in uh, dentin lead to a higher incidence of fracture in endodontically treated teeth. Therefore, the loss of structural integrity due to access preparation was one of the main reasons for the teeth becoming more brittle. Also, the access preparations result in increased cuspal defle uh, deflection as you can see here. You can see this, um, uh, you know, this is a rather large access preparation and you can find that, you know, as forces, as this tooth is subjected to forces, you find that you will have more cuspal deflection on either side and that cuspal deflection can lead to fracture of the, uh, uh, you know, fracture of the teeth. And he also uh, said that the loss of protective feedback mechanism that is present uh, when pulp is removed is also one of the reasons why you could have, um, you know, um, you could have more chance of the endodontically treat fracturing. Now, if you see this situation here, he also said that, you know, it's not only good pulpal treatment, that means not only good endodontic treatment, but also good prosthodontic reconstruction that is required for the teeth to uh, remain well. If you see this tooth here, this has been root canaled and a, a silver amalgam filling has been placed here. Nothing wrong with that. Silver amalgam is a lovely material. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you see very closely, you can find that on the mesial aspect, you have caries. And the other problem is a large part of the margin is on the amalgam filling. Now, that's not really, um, you know, uh, very well suited. So we have gone in, we have removed uh, the amalgam filling. We have removed all the caries. We have gone in and restored, um, you know, the, the tooth with the composite. And also the margin is now not on the filling, but on the um, uh, tooth. And that is very important. As far as possible, margin of the crown should be on the tooth and not on the uh, uh, restoring material. And we have given the patient an all ceramic uh, crown. Uh, this is a lithium disilicate all ceramic crown. Now, this is a very important, um, you know, line diagram that I'd like you to pay attention to. If you find here that, you know, whenever uh, forces, um, whenever tooth is subjected forces, you get cuspal flexure. Now, this is a tooth which is uh, completely virgin. There are no restorations, etc. So you, you will still find some amount of flexure, but that is tolerated by the, absorbed by the tooth. Now, if you have a, a, a filling that is uh, present, uh, you know, involving the marginal ridge here, you find that the cuspal flexure will increase, but it, it usually will not, uh, as long as the tooth is vital, it will not cause fracture of the restoration um, uh, of the tooth normally. And number C, you can see that the tooth has been restored endodontically. And uh, if you see D, you find that a filling has been placed here now. In this situation, if a crown or an endocrown or some sort of like he says shoeing is not done, then there is a good possibility that a portion of the, a, a cusp and normally the functional cusp fractures out. So that is why it is very important, especially in posterior teeth, that um, you know some sort of um, uh, uh, you know cuspal coverage has to be done. And this is uh, if you see the last diagram, which is E, you find that. Uh, this has been endodontically treated and it has been restored with, with something known as an endocrown, which I will talk about a little bit later. And you find that both the cusps have been um, covered by the restoration. And normally we use um, lithium disilicate for this because it bonds to the tooth structure. And uh, this has found to be either this or a regular crown, whatever. Something needs to be done to, to preserve these uh, a cusp and to reduce the cuspal flexure. So this is a very, very important uh, diagram that we need to go through. Now, do all endodontically treat require posts? Now, that's a big question that, you know, a big dilemma that as clinicians that we have. Now, when I was a student in BDS in the 1980s, um, you know, we were taught that all endodontically treat regardless of whether it's an anterior or posterior teeth needs to be 
uh, restored with a um, uh, with a post um, and it was th also thought that uh, the post increased the strength of the tooth but of course um, those concepts have changed now so the question is do post actually strengthen endodontic lip teeth and what is the answer for that okay so the answer is that it is the primary purpose of a post is to retain the core um, and, and it is not to strengthen the tooth on a tooth where there is extensive coronal tooth structure. Therefore, a post needs to be given only in teeth where is there is extensive loss of tooth structure. Also, in fact, the preparation of post space and the placement can weaken the tooth and lead to root fracture. So that is very, very important. You know, now the current concept is place posts, um, you know, wherever there is loss of extensive loss of coronal tooth structure, number one. Number two, place the narrowest diameter post which is possible and not the largest as we used to be uh, taught, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So if you see these two situations, you know, there is a, there is a major difference between the tooth on the left and the tooth on the right. The tooth on the left, you can see there's a huge filling that is there, which, um, you know, which extends almost uh, three quarters of the way. And here there is, you know, the, the, question, uh, the, the, uh, the restoration is much smaller than what it is on the left hand side. And, uh, you know, in a situation like on the left hand side, it is definitely uh, uh, imperative that you put a post inside. And also you have a ferrule. Now I will talk about what a ferrule exactly is. And on the right hand side, uh, you know, you can choose either to put a post or not to put a post. I would go ahead and put a post in, in both of these teeth. And I will explain to you why I, I, I uh, would do that. So what about anterior teeth? You know, do all anterior teeth which are uh, root canal, do they need to have a uh, coronal coverage to be done? So if an anterior tooth in, if there is an anterior tooth and there is minimum loss of tooth structure, you do not require a, a post and you, and you just need to put a bonded restoration there. So in a situation like this, where you don't have much loss of tooth structure and the patient has trauma and a root canal has to be done, you just go in and build it up with composite restoration and uh, also close the, um, you, you know, just give a restoration to, uh, to a situation like this. But if an endodontically treated tooth is going to receive a crown, then a post is often indicated. And the reason for that is that the anterior teeth must resist lateral and shearing forces. And the pulp chambers are just too small to provide adequate retention and resistance form without a post. And therefore, um, like I said in the previous slide, I would put posts in both the left and the right side uh, teeth. So in a situation like this, where I'm going to do do endodont, uh, you know, endo treatment for both these teeth, I would go ahead and put posts in them, and I would build them up, and uh, and I will discuss this case uh, in detail um, as we go along. What about premolar teeth? Again, premolar teeth have small pulp chambers, uh, and they are subjected to greater lateral forces than molars, and therefore, in a situation like this, I would still go ahead and place a single post into the larger of the two canals. What about molars? The molars have large pulp chambers, even in a situation like this, where almost 50% of the tooth is lost. You have a large pulp chamber here. You can see that the tooth is endodontically treated. And then you have gone in and, uh, you know, gone about three, four millimeters into the canal and placed the core material there. And you have also gone and done a ferrule here. Now, again, as, as I said, I will talk to you about what a ferrule is. For, ferrule is trying to get the margin onto the, uh, not trying to, to get the margin onto the tooth surface rather than onto the restoration. So that is very, very important. So this is what a ferrule is. So it is a minimum height of 1.5 to 2 millimeters of intact tooth structure above the crown margin. So you can see here, you can see this is the restoration. You have about two millimeters of tooth structure here. And the crown margin comes exactly on the tooth structure and not on the uh, core material. If you have the margin on the core material, um, you know, there is a possibility of, of fracture in that region. Um, 
you can either do uh, surgical crown lengthening or orthodontic extrusion if required in severely damaged teeth to um, expose additional tooth structure. In, in, in my uh, clinic, most of the time, if, uh, if we want to get a ferrule and we don't have one, then we go ahead and do osseous crown lengthening if required to uh, improve the, uh, to increase the ferrule. And you can see here, this is a case uh, with ferrule and this is a case without ferrule. You can see um, the margins, even, even on the lingual, you have about two millimeters of tooth structure, which is sufficient. And, um, you know, um, you find that in a situation like this, where there is no ferrule, um, and the margin is on the restoration, you find that there is a high chance of fracture of the uh, tooth, of the root. In molars, if we are going to place uh, um, posts, then we are going to place them in the largest uh, canal that in the mandibular molars, it's in the, in the distal canal and in the, uh, in the maxilla, we know that the palatal root is the largest and therefore we will place a post in the uh, uh, palatal canal. What about posts? What, you know, we have different types of posts. Um, you know, most of the time, of course, we use fiber posts now, but there are, um, you know, different types of posts that we can use. You have two main types. You have the custom fabricated posts and then you have the prefabricated posts. So this is a custom fabricated post made of metal. And these are prefabricated base, uh, posts made of metal and um, glass ceramics. So cu custom fabricated posts, again, when I was a student, uh, you know, the state of the art was uh, to do custom fabricated posts. Um, but of course, now we have uh, reduced the usage of that because it requires multiple appointments and temporization and it requires lab fees. Uh, the only area where I would use a custom fabricated post now is if you have a misaligned a tooth where the post must be angled in relation to the post. Uh, where the core must be angled in relation to the post. Only in that case, I would probably go in for a custom post. Otherwise, I would go in for a, a prefabricated post. Uh, of course, one of the main problems is contamination of the root canal system because you need to temporize that and send it. And nowadays, normally what, as far as I know, what endodontists do is they finish the root canal, they put a definite restoration. And if a post is required, they also go in and do a post before they um, you know, before they finalize it. So in that situation, you prevent um, contamination from happening. So that is a big problem with uh, prefabricated posts. Um, they can be either made of metal or zirconia or ceramic. Um, and of course, if they're made of metal, they can definitely not be used under all ceramic restorations. However, they can be used under zirconia restorations because they are opaque. And they can, of course, cause root fracture. So this is a situation where a, a, a custom fabricated post was used. Here we have used a fit check to see where it's binding. And it's very important that all the binding areas are removed as it, the root can snap. Um, and then you can see a nice ferrule, about two millimeters of ferrule all around. And this is the uh, crown in position and this has been in the patient for more than eight to ten years now so these are excellent ways of doing it it's just uh, we don't do them um, very much anymore this is another situation you can see uh, the patient has got a bridge uh, from uh, i mean they are actually uh, joint crowns which are i would uh, recommend that nobody ever do joint crowns um, there is no justification the justifications that i get uh, from doctors is that, uh, you know, they are trying to splint a weak tooth uh, with, a, uh, with a strong tooth that is definitely not justified. And I'll show you the, re, uh, you know, the problems that, that occur with the joint crowns. You can see here, we have gone ahead and split this uh, with a uh, crown splitting burr. Um, you know, there are ma many metal cutting burrs that are available in the market. I then use a uh, Christiansen crown remover to remove these pieces off. And you can see here after uh, the amount of decay that was there uh, under the canine, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and then we had to go ahead and ground lengthen the tooth um, and then make a free back, free, uh, you know, prefabricated, I mean, custom fabricated post. I use a matchstick like this to take an impression um, and then get your 
get the get the post fabricated and this is a, a zirconia uh, layered with ceramic restoration i don't like to do these uh, very much because of the delamination that can happen between the zirconia and um, uh, you know the ceramic and this is the final processes that is there in the patient's mouth what about prefabricated you have different materials you have either stainless steel titanium uh, you know gold plated uh, brass um, ceramic so many different materials are there of course titanium i would not use because it, it's very important that we uh, that when we place a post inside we also see to it that there is a chance of re retrievement of those in case of retreatment so that is very very important um, uh, situation uh, you yeah, when i started my practice in uh, 19 in 19 late 1990s we were using a lot of these uh, uh, stainless steel and brass posts um, Of course, we don't use them anymore, um, and and we had the problem of um, corrosion with these, and therefore I would not recommend that anybody use uh, these posts anymore. There are much better materials available in the market now. Of course, you have uh, ceramic and zirconia posts. Um, they are more aesthetic. They are weaker than metal, so you need to put a thicker post inside. And if you want to put a thicker post inside, then you are weakening the uh, root structure. And there is a higher chance of uh, uh, fracture of these teeth. Also, it is next to impossible to retrieve these. And therefore, if you have uh, any problem with the with the endo treatment, then most probably it will require extraction of of uh, of the tooth. Or in some cases, maybe you can do some surgical uh, endodontic correction if if possible. Then, of course, uh, fiber posts, uh, you know, have, have uh, revolutionized the market. Uh, we use glass fiber posts now. Uh, I'm just showing you an example of a 3M fiber post. There are many, many companies who, who manufacture these posts um, and they're all good. What are the advantages of these fiber posts over metal? Of course, they are more aesthetic. Then, of course, uh, because of resin cements, they bond with the dentin to form a monoblock okay at least for uh, uh, so some period of time they form they ad adhere to it and form a monoblock uh, the bonding will minimize the um, uh, wedging effect none of the metal posts that we have uh, bond with the tooth um, you know they are just cemented in position so there's a higher chance of wedging with those um, they require less dentin removal to to accommodate a shorter thinner post okay so like i said earlier nowadays we we use the 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 thinnest diameter post that is possible uh, unlike in the past of course uh, they do not uh, cause any metal allergies or corrode and they 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 are said to be easier to remove however i'm not uh, totally convinced that they are because you need to go down to the full depth and remove the whole post so uh, I'm sure they are uh, not as easy as as is as is said. What about uh, post designs? Basically, you have tapered posts or you have parallel posts, like you can see here. These are the uh, parallel posts, and these are the tapered posts that are there. Um, the parallel posts are more retentive, but they require more dentin removal. And if they require more dentin removal, then there is a higher chance of of fracture of the root. Uh, they can either be active or passive. You can see here this is an active post and this is a passive post. Um, and, and these are, of course, passive posts. Um, so the active posts engage dent and dentin and transfer more stresses to the remaining tooth structure. Again, active posts, uh, because they transfer more stresses to the tooth structure, there is a higher rate of the, um, you know, the retention is better, but there is a higher chance of fracture of these uh, posts. Now, you can see here uh, parallel sided metal posts. They are more retentive. They have no wedging effect, okay, because they are not tapered. Uh, but in tapered roots, they may not fit coronally here. And so there is a higher chance of fracture in this region. They may weaken the tooth apically. As you can see, the amount of tooth structure remaining is much less. And you can have root fracture in 
in the apical region as well. So um, uh, the failure is often catastrophic. You find that you will have uh, the tooth, tooth will crack or tooth will split. What about the tapered pores? They fit much better. Okay. Uh, there's less, less risk of apical fracture. There's less risk of post, post fracture. Um, and root may fracture due to the wedge effect. But it is much less than um, when you use a parallel size of post. And normally, failures are decementation. So there is less problem with the tooth fracturing with these posts than it is with a so it is always better um, to use a tapered post rather than a parallel sided post. If you see the modulus of elasticity, so dentin is about around 15 um, um, uh, modulus of elasticity. Your fiber posts are around 30 and you can see as they go um, further away, you find that the modulus of elasticity increases. So metal uh, posts, there's more chance, uh, metal parallel posts, there's more chance of root fracture. And in fiber posts, normally you get decementation de and uh, normally root, uh, uh, the, there is no uh, root fracture that occurs. How do you use this? Okay, you need to know the anatomy, otherwise you will end up with perforation. Um, you can you need to go in and remove the gutta percha so that can be done either by thermal method or by mechanical methods okay thermal is uh, safer but it takes more time and mechanical methods use uh, piezo reamers and and gates glitten burrs what should be the length we all know that we need to leave about four to five millimeters of uh, uh, you know gutta percha to create a proper seal the width, we need to keep them as narrow as possible. The, the wider they are, the higher chance of fracture of the, um, you know, the, the root there could be. So here you can see in one of uh, one case, you can see that there is a crack here because of, of the wide uh, post that is placed. Um, of course, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, we know post cementation. Um, in the first two, we very rarely use now. Um, RMGI uh, is used for if you are uh, cementing a metal uh, post, we could use an RMGI cement. And uh, resin cements, of course, uh, are, are the standard of care now. We use them for all our uh, glass fiber posts, fiber posts. So I'm not going into the detail of these. Of course, uh, these are technique sensitive and all the contamination uh, um, you know, all the if the surface of the root is contaminated, these will not bond, and therefore it is very very imperative to keep them clean. Um, and of course, when you are bonding to fiber, you can either use a total edge technique or you can use a self edge technique. Usually, when you are bonding, you are using the self edge technique, um, and most of the cements now uh, contain uh, both the etchant and the bonding. And um, and so, uh, you know, or you can you can use the single bond. Uh, I mean, you can use any of these eight generation bonding where everything is in a single bottle. Um, you select the post uh, depending on these. You select it according to the length, width, the angulation and the curvature. OK. Um, so like we said, it should be uh, as long into the root as it is above it, at least as long. Um, it should be between half and two thirds into the total um, total, uh, total root length. It should remain in the straight part. If we try to go into the curved part, we are going to perforate, and um, uh, you know that will lead to a lot of other problems. Um, and it should conform to the size and shape of the root. So you can see here, you have a universal, this is I'm talking about only about the 3M uh, system, but all the other systems I'm sure have uh, similar, um, you know, uh, drill specific, you have a universal drill to remove the gutta percha. And then depending on the size of the post that we are going to use, we have drills for that. So you have a yellow, uh, blue and a red. Um, 
you know all, all of these need the uh, post area needs to be cleaned okay now you need to remove all the debris from the canal this is the, this is the technique that i use we remove all the debris from the canal all the gutta pacha and all, you know whatever there is inside i clean with edta uh, scrub it with edta rinse out with saline um, dry the canal with paper moins and not desiccate it and coat uh, the post with silane that is uh, you can use uh, ceramic primer or any other um, uh, silane that is available you mix the u200 this is a 3m uh, u200 use the spreader to load material into the canal um, you coat the post and and place it into the canal rotate the post hold firmly in place and right cure so i will just show you one case on how i have gone ahead and done it this is a patient who came to me i think it was about uh, 8 or 10 years after the crown was placed i had not paid, placed a post in this uh, situation so now i recommend that uh, for all endodontically treated teeth especially in the anterior please place a post before you uh, go ahead so we go ahead and prepare the canal we use the drill um, and then clean it with alcohol and then silenate the post mix the uh, u200 and then go ahead with a lent with a uh, with a lentil spiral just coat the canal completely coat the post and then place the post uh, into the canal uh, most of these posts allow light transmission and and if 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 it doesn't cure with that they are all uh, dual cure cements so so they, they will cure automatically and then uh, build up the core portion so this is after the uh, area is built up completely this is very important you need to clean out all the debris that is there inside i have a chair side sandblaster it's very important to have a good sandblaster small sandblaster with you sandblast the area this is very very important you need to use pumice and just pumice and water clean all the uh, smear layer and everything off the tooth load the cement into the um, uh, crown um, place it on the tooth tack cure for 2 seconds remove all the excess out and then allow it to cure for 5 minutes so that's how we go ahead and we um, uh, you know um, uh, re-cement so this is a case which I'm going to just show you. It's a, a you know video of uh, how this is done. It's not my video, um, but um, this is these are just the different steps. So you can see here. Oh, sorry. So these are all the different materials that we use. Um, this is a bulk fill material for, uh, I will explain as, as the video runs. You remove the temporary crown after root canal. Temporary crown is made and kept. Like I said, this is not my video. You use sodium bicarbonate to clean out everything. I've never used this before. Go ahead and prepare the canal uh, with the different drills. The access cavity in this is too big. I would definitely not advise such a large access cavity to be made. Use a universal drill to remove the gutta pacha. So you can see that the gutta pacha is being removed. So we are using a red band uh, burr, so uh, size of post, um, which is probably the largest size that I would use in uh, um, our population. I've never used the blue. And then you go ahead and clean it. I use sodium hypochlorite. Uh, I, I use uh, EDTA to clean out everything. Use paper points to clean everything out. Check the size of the post and um, cut it according to size. Clean it with alcohol. I also apply uh, some, uh, uh, you know, the, and then you dry the post.
So for us, they call it uh, U200. Um, you know, they have different names for different countries. Because we don't get these tips here. Um, I think we can get them, but, you know, people are worried about uh, wasting some of the material. So we do our jugad of uh, doing it with a lentilo. Place the post in. Cure it. And then build up the core portion. And then we know how to go ahead. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to skip the uh, rest of the video. So this is a, a patient again who came, um, you know, uh, with a fractured crown again. It reminded me that I need to keep uh, place posts after, um, uh, you know, root canals. Same thing. We went ahead, placed the post inside, etched, built the core portion. Um, you know, use always use uh, retraction cord. I sometimes use a two-step technique like I've done here, and sometimes I use the single-step technique. I prefer the single-step technique to the two-step technique. This is a very nice impression. You can see it has gone uh, beyond the uh, um, finish line. And then we take a pre-impression and make a temporary crown. And this is the final, uh, uh, you know, pa patient has come with, uh, I think uh, sometimes it's difficult to make out which is the temporary and which is the final. Anyway, this, the, this is the final crown. We have uh, uh, done a lithium disilicate. We have etched with, for 30 seconds. You can see the frosted appearance. Um, and then um, uh, we go ahead and cement the crown in position. So this is actually a 10-year-old uh, uh, PFM. And this is the new crown that is cemented for the patient. Uh, this is uh, another case where you can see the tooth is discolored. It looks fine over here. But when you see on the palatal, you can see that there is so much of caries and so much of discoloration. So we go ahead and build up the tooth, prep it. This is a single step impression. And this is the final crown in position. Core materials, again, there are different types of core materials. You have amalgam, glass iron over composite. Of course, the most commonly one, common one we use is composite resin now. Uh, and of course, it's very important to keep the area clean, otherwise it will not bond. So I will, because of paucity of time, I'm going to skip this. Uh, amalgam, of course, uh, you know, we all know fantastic material. Unfortunately, you cannot prepare it immediately. And people have stopped using it now because of, of the concern of presence of mercury. Glass ionoma is really not a good core buildup material, so I would try and avoid it if possible. Um, and composite, we all know uh, what the advantages and disadvantages of the material are. Of course, this study in 2002 um, in JPD, they said that any of these materials are good, but what they found was that provided a 2 millimeter ferrule existed on the margin of the healthy tooth structure. This is very, very important. And what I find is a lot of our colleagues, I find they don't give enough importance to the ferrule. The ferrule is such an important um, uh, tool in our hands. So that two millimeters of tooth structure will make a huge difference when we are, um, yeah, you know, when we are preparing our teeth. So this is again, uh, again, reiterating the ferrule concept. And you can see that again, there is a two millimeter, um, uh, you know, two millimeter wall here. The other thing I would, uh, I would say is even though we have all these resin cements and all of that, the basic concepts that, uh, you know, that, that we have learned in tooth preparation are still as important as, as they were. Um, you know, early on and to try and make these as parallel as possible. So to, to get them at least six degrees, you know, at a maximum six degrees on either side and not taper them so much. This taper is, is just a bit too much. But even with this taper, having the ferrule makes a huge difference and also to use a tapered post rather than a parallel post. Um, so what would we like to do? Um, minimum loss of, loss of tooth structure, if you are going to root canal tooth, just do a composite resin 
if you if you uh, have aesthetic requirements you can do either bleaching or composite resin or a ceramic veneer if there is moderate then do a post and a composite restoration if it is severe then go ahead and do a post core and a crown um we know here so if there's a minimal loss of tooth structure we can just use composite and uh, restore if it is more than that this is not a case of uh, you know in an endodontically treated uh, person but you can see here that you know if the aesthetic requirement is more then we can always go in and do very beautiful uh, uh, you know lithium disilicate uh, laminates um, metal ceramic crowns of course their use has come down now i myself in the anterior region almost never do uh, metal ceramic uh, restorations because the amount of tooth preparation is much more there and also the aesthetics is much better when you talk about all ceramic restorations so all ceramic restorations also i prefer up to the premola i prefer to do uh, you know um, a lithium disilicate and the posterior is uh, I, I i somehow feel that i'm happy doing uh, porcelain fused to metal rather than doing zirconia unless the patient is extremely keen on doing that i normally if given a choice i would just do porcelain fused to metal uh, restorations so this is the case that i was talking this was the first case that i had shown you you can see here a patient came with these fractured teeth uh, we just built them up for her on the first day uh, because i don't do root canals i had to refer them to my endodontist we went ahead and uh, did endo for both the teeth built them up with post and cores did the preparation this is a single step impression which i normally use uh, the temporization is done uh, using uh, bisacral material there are all companies have bisacral materials these are the final crowns and this is uh, how we check to see that the fit these are sinter diamond burrs and um, these are uh, silly, uh, these are polishers uh, diamond in impregnated polishers and then we use diamond polishing paste to smoothen out everything etch the crown use ceramic primers again pumice clean clean everything up um, you know do your uh, tack cure clean out all the cement and then allow it to set for um, five minutes so this is um, immediately after cementation you can see how uh, how nice they look this is actually a week after cementation and this papilla will fill in and this is a patient after about eight years um, you can see here i mean this is a photograph that she took a selfie and sent it to me because at that time it was uh, you know we our clinics were not open so uh, this is another situation you can see the gingiva is inflamed here uh, we had to go in and do some uh, uh, osseous crown lengthening and then uh, give her temporaries wait for a month of course the reason for the inflammation is, is that we had compromised on the biologic width um, of the patient so that has to be restored again final crowns zirconia because they were metal pores here i had to do zirconia with uh, lead uh, uh, porcelain on it at that time we were using uh, these uh, unison capsules they were u100 capsules so you can see here after about um, uh, about a month you can see that the papilla is completely closed um, and this is a patient with the finished uh, restoration of course how do we choose um, you know what we need to do um, so in the posteriors if the marginal ridges are lost uh, if you need cuspid protection these are the options that you have you have onlays you have crowns and you have endo crowns so your onlays can be either composite or all ceramic you know it conserves more tooth structure um, so we can use onlays they are contact indicated if you are if you are using the abutment for an FPD. Of course, um, um, I prefer to use um, uh, lithium disilicate wherever I can. So this is a situation you can see here, quite a large uh, cavity, and we have got a um, in uh, on lift uh, uh, fabricated. Same uh, procedures. I will not go through that. 
and of course your crowns you have uh, metal ceramic crowns can be used or your all ceramic crowns can be used if it is in the anterior region i use all ceramic crowns my choice of all ceramic crowns is is uh, lithium disilicate uh, in some cases i would use uh, zirconia so this case again we have uh, we have seen it you can see we have made a nice um, uh, you know lithium disilicate crown here and this is the tooth in occlusion you really cannot make out the difference between the natural dentition and the uh, the crown the aesthetics is superb and if it's posterior if it is zirconia then i i prefer to use uh, monolithic zirconia because again um, you know the delamination has reduced from when it came out initially but there are chances of delamination and therefore i prefer to use uh, monolithic zirconia crowns rather than um, uh, layered zir zirconia crowns of course and and the last and final is you know these endocrowns that have come out uh, recently um and and here of course the the crown is extends into the pulp chamber um and it's indicated mainly in the posterior teeth and by posterior teeth i mean the molars they are not indicated either in the premolars or the um uh, anterior teeth um i don't have any experience with endocrowns my main concern with them is if there is a if there is a possibility of a retreatment to happen then um, it will be very difficult uh, to remove these crowns so as an alternative uh, you know for a for a tooth that is where there is very minimum tooth structure um, and you know there is no possibility of crown lengthening or any such procedure only in those situations would i recommend uh, the use of endocrowns of course they are recommended uh, quite widely now and so at some point i would definitely try them out and and um, you know give my opinion so you can see here that um, uh, you know there isn't much tooth structure left so it's extended into the uh, tooth structure and these of course can be fabricated only with uh, lithium disilicate because you need to bond it to the tooth structure and um, you know uh, they need to be bonded well or uh, they will not stay um, so what is the uh, best current approach for restoring endodontically treated teeth okay so number one you minimize uh, tissue uh, sacrifice especially in the cervical area so that a ferrule effect can be created very important you need a ferrule you need to be well versed with adhesive procedures try to use uh, crowns where uh, adhesion is possible and uh, use post and core materials uh, where the physical properties are close to that of the natural dentition because of the limitations of adhesive procedures so uh, wherever possible try to use a, a fiber post so uh, finally um, unless the majority of natural tooth substance remains after endodontic treatment it is safer to provide some kind of cuspal coverage in the uh, final coronal restoration since most teeth that require endodontic treatment usually are damaged severely as a result of caries fracture or both so wherever possible try to give a cuspal curvature especially in the posterior teeth in conclusion avoid contamination and therefore try to avoid doing the um, uh, you know the custom posts wherever possible provide cuspal coverage for posterior teeth preserve radicular and coronal tooth structure as much as possible use posts with adequate strength in thin diameters use them as thin as possible and as, as long as possible maintaining 4 to 5 mm of uh, gutta percha uh, at the at the apex provide adequate post length for retention uh, maximize resistance form include an adequate ferrule please keep in mind about the ferrule it is a very very important uh, concept and it will really help you and use posts that are retrievable so i thank you very much for uh, your kind attention and uh, if there are any questions uh, i'm very happy to answer them thank you thank you so much sir it was a much needed presentation i must say lots of my uh, lots of doubts my doubts and i think most of the listeners who are having doubts many of them would have been you know assorted so thank you so much for this presentation uh, 
I think uh, post and core and restoration of mutilated teeth is a much needed but very less discussed topic because either we just go for implants as a clinician just extract it we don't think that much ki okay unless an until patient says no i want to save the tooth and if uh, the clinician is not well educated and well versed it will eventually happen in uh, you know loss of tooth only so thank you so much sir thanks a lot i hope i answered your questions <laughs> yes i have few questions i'll be asking you now uh, so shall we go ahead with the questions yes, sir yes please okay sir um the first question is sir um like uh, being an endo so uh, uh, my take on giving posts is like uh, do conservative preparations avoid giving posts and all those things so you mentioned that uh, placing posts in all interior teeth yes so if the tooth structure is really good and i have done you know very conservative preparation so no no what i meant was if you are going to if there is minimal tooth structure loss just give a composite restoration and leave it right sir but right if you are going to give a crown it is better to give a post because okay. the pulp space is very very limited right. there right. and therefore you saw my cases you know these are right. you know when you've been in practice for 20 30 years these cases come back to haunt you and i also mentioned that give the narrowest diameter post that you can right narrowest right. that right. is very important so it's not that every endodontically treated tooth is going to get a post but if you are going to crown. give a crown then it may be better to if you are going to give a veneer or you are going to give a composite restoration then you don't need a post inside right sir right um so uh, uh in endo but i'll ask you my first time asking my questions only so sure, we'll sure. take other questions later sure, so sure. um like i prepare canals 25 four percent so there is this case that i have scheduled and i know post will be required in that okay uh, i so do you suggest any uh, how much should i widen the canal or i should select the post according to my canal see earlier when i was a student in the 80s they always said use the widest post possible okay now the concept is use the narrowest post that means i never widen my canals okay so i go to, you know like uh, again i don't want to talk about any company this thing right now but if you if you say 3m has got 0 uh, i mean uh, sorry 0 1 2 3 okay okay so okay. you have uh, white yellow red blue i have okay. never gone beyond red i always okay. unfortunately we don't get white in india okay so we do get white we do get so normally i will use only yellow okay sir okay so uh, as far as possible i will not widen what i will do is i will just reshape it so that slightly reshape it so that it just goes in that's all nothing else okay. i will never increase the side of the canal okay sir um so one uh, a question uh, is for posterior teeth what is your take on placing the post in more than one canal normally we place in the wider canal right correct but, uh, but uh, if if uh, we more we need more retention so placing two posts in one tooth does that help help see in molars only in less than 10% of the cases i would even consider placing a post See, I showed you one uh, line diagram of a case where two yes, thirds sir. of the tooth is gone. Right. Is, what is more important there is not the post. What is more important is you have enough pulpal chamber there to place your core material. You need to go two to three millimeters into the uh, uh, into your canal. Right. And sir. more importantly, you need to have a ferrule. That is the if. one if everybody goes away with one point in their mind it is that i must get a ferrule right so sir. there is a, a, a absolutely no um, you know no, no reason in my mind why we should do two posts okay sir um so uh, what about uh, many many clinicians use uh, glass inomer cement for cementing fiber post no it will not work you see you need a monoblock 
right you, right, you, right. you need you know what is a monoblock a monoblock is basically the fiber posts getting bonded to the cement uh, to the resin cement and your resin cement can bonded to your tooth structure so with if you don't do that then the whole concept of using a fiber post is useless right right sir um next question sir it's from my side you mentioned in your presentation that you use you prefer pfm over zirconia yes. in posterior crowns yes. i would like to know the answer of that sir i'm <laughs> i'm still figuring that out okay but what i found is that I, I, you know over a period of time i have got kind of disillusioned with uh, zirconia okay number one if you uh, number one it is extremely hard that material okay and in my own case my own tooth the zirconia crown fractured my posterior tooth okay. you see that's the kind of loading that you are doing with uh, with, uh, with with zirconia i feel that we are doing i mean I, this might sound uh, you know i'm not an expert on it but you know wherever possible i don't do zirconia I, I i i you know i i have done a few of them i was super thrilled when zirconia came out and when we did the lead zirconia and then once it started chipping i i just uh, all of us have that problem yes sir. the delamination of zirconia and it's a really really difficult to explain to the patients to the patient. uh, so you know if, if at all i would do monolith i would not do uh, layer number 1 number 2 um, if the patient you know again people say if the patient is a bruxer uh, use zirconia but again you are putting more load on to the tooth you know um, again I, I, like i said i'm not an expert at it this is my own personal opinion i may be wrong but um, you know if uh, you know uh, a, a lot, lot of a lot of our these things are based on what company and uh, i think we should make our own opinions right. i'm not saying but that i will not use zirconia i'm not saying that i'm not saying i won't use but right. i've had a lot of my colleagues having their zirconia crowns debond right sir and i personally have had one or two of my breaches which all in my 30 years of practice which almost never happens with pfm it has happened with zirconia now i don't know if it is a coincidence or if it is something that i did not do right but i know alarm bells are starting to ring in right. my ear. and so a lot lot of thing you know comes up with experience like we'll to give as you said there will be few things which will come and haunt you 10 years later exactly. if you are still doing the practice exactly. see i so, make yeah. lots of mistakes you know yes, i'm not sir. saying that i don't make mistakes i make lots of mistakes but i learn from those mistakes yes sir as uh, a last question for the session um you uh, we place fiber posts in uh, anterior tooth if we are giving lithium disulfide crown emax crown uh should the shade of composite we should be careful about the shade of composite that we are giving with the fiber post i don't think so because the, the you know most of the uh, posts are kind of uh, uh, you know if they are the glass fiber post then they are trans translucent right sir so i don't find that see as far as possible i don't like to correct my shade with the cement with the shade of the cement used i use translucent shade right sir uh, and um, uh, you know so i'm not i'm not faced you face that problem no sir i have not faced it uh, maybe i have not noticed it so i was thinking maybe you know you you um, you have experience lot of experience so i'll just ask yeah. no i have not i have not i have not uh, you know i have not faced that problem actually so far okay sir okay roxan uh, has asked one question here what is it right. so crowns versus, versus posts, posts which is which is better i don't think there's a uh, uh, endocrowns normally we do in molars in molars i prefer not to do posts right. again i don't have enough exp i don't have any actually i have no experience with endocrowns endocrowns it's just something that i've read my concern is this if you have uh, you know as an endodontist uh, you right. will be able to tell me if you are going right into the pulp chamber 
if you right. have to do a, a retreatment tell me how difficult it will be for you to actually um, you know remove all of that lithium disilicate and it will, the, because the, normally when we do re rct re root canals we prefer taking out the crown first exactly and then yes. only Here it's go. not possible to yes. take out the crown so that so, is my that is my concern with endocrowns it's not that i'm against them or anything right. and in fact i'm going to try them out and okay. and and see how how they actually hold out so i think in the le next le lecture we might hear from you about endocrowns endocrowns yes <laughs> that's, my, that's my next uh, uh, project uh, okay sir okay uh, Thank you so much, sir. It was a very, very beautiful and much uh, well explained presentation, especially the ferrule part. To be honest, being an endo also, there was some doubt about ferrule. Which yeah. part exactly ferrule is? What to do? But now it's very clear. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for Thank explaining you. it so beautifully. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me and all the best. Yes, sir. Have a nice day, sir. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye, sir. So that was Dr. P C J. His knowledge, his tips, tricks, everything, and I am honestly saying the ferrule part. I loved it because well explained. We have seen the diagram a lot of times, you know, but uh, seeing it on um, that uh, that tooth he showed, I have actually taken a picture in my mobile. So thank you so much. All of those who missed or joined late can go back and see this session. It's there on app. It's there on YouTube. It will be there on Facebook. With this, the morning session is over. But I we'll come back again. I'll come back again with two amazing speakers uh, in the evening session, which starts at four. We joining us will be Dr. Menka join, uh, from England. She's a dentist and leadership coach, and she's having a COVID survival session. Basically, she's going to talk about effective leadership through turbulent times. Dr. Sunil Rao, microendodontist, is going to talk about single file root canal system. Uh, Dr. India, he is going to talk about, uh, as I said, single file system and reciprocation in endodontics, an alternative to root re endo. So I'm looking forward to both the in the evening, and I am looking forward to seeing you guys also there. So you can have lunch, enjoy your you know afternoon, and then come back maybe with a cup of tea, may not be with a cup of tea, and yes. Uh, thank you for reminding me that uh, Roxon no lace therapy laser. You, can you are you have this chance of winning this uh, machine. This is a lucky draw com competition. You can win this therapy laser, um, no lace therapy laser. What you need to do is, as I said, download that for DC DRDCA. After that, follow FB DRDCA page. Take part in scientific sessions. Take active participation which means share this session with your friends, tag them, ask questions, and take the screenshots while doing this. Send it to us at drdca2020 at the rate of gmail.com, and you might be the lucky one. So as I said, uh, 28th and this one. Um, three days are left now. This session happened last weekend. So maybe this is your last chance to do this. What you need to do is, if you have attended Dr. Rumpa's session, please go to this form, the questionnaire that is there on DRDCA page, that is there on the app. Fill the questionnaire, send the questions, send the answers to us, um, and you might be the lucky one to win some gift hampers, I will say, some materials, some dental materials from Pulp Dent, and it, it has been sponsored by M&M &M 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 Dental Products. So at that note, uh, I'll end uh, today's session uh, morning session and I'll see you in the evening. Be there and I'll see you. We'll have fun. Bye-bye.